get on the show. Call now. 888-640-9385. It's Sid Rosenberg on 640 Sports. Memorable moments on this show. I was bringing on my old partner at WFAN, Joe Beningo. He's like, oh, my God, bro, is that Edison Lighthouse? We're like, what? How would you know that? The it fact isn't that, that he knew that name right Edison off Edison Lighthouse, right, the top right of off his the head. bat, yeah. That's Joe Beningo for you. Little Love Grows at uh, 7.05 on your Wednesday morning. Again, coming up in about 40 minutes, he covers the New York Mets on a daily basis for ESPNNewYork.com. Mets and Nationals, game two of that three-game set from Washington later on tonight. Jordan Zimmerman on the mound for the Nets. Rookie of the Year, reigning Rookie of the Year, Jacob DeGrom on the mound for the Mets. Adam Rubin will be here at 7.45. Senator from the great state of Minnesota, Norm Coleman. He'll talk about this lousy... U.S. Iran deal. He's coming up at 8. He's my cousin, too. And then 9 o'clock, we'll talk to Joe Frisaro, who covers the Marlins, who once again took it in the ass from the Braves last night. And they stink. Season's over. It's all over. It's all over. Two games in. It's a nice segue into our next guest. Kind of is. Yeah, she was tweeting anal. Um, She's back again. You've heard her on the Howard Stern Show. You've heard her on CBS Sports Radio, and now back again for her second visit here out of New York City, the very entertaining Elizabeth Mandel. Good morning, Liz. How are you? Hi, I'm great. How are you? Welcome back. Thank you so much. Yeah, you seem, um, one of the reasons why we, like, we, we did bring you back, besides the fact that you were entertaining last time, and you do provide a service for my Neanderthal male listeners, is your enthusiasm. You get very, you tweet a lot of stuff, and it seems like you really enjoy coming on the show. Yeah, I mean, I love, um, I mean, the last time was a lot of fun, and I'm glad to be on the show this time and ready for whatever questions you want to ask me. Now, what about when, when you go on with, with, uh, with Howard? Is he, does he share, uh, is the enthusiasm shared mutually like it is here when you're on with me, with Stern? Yes, absolutely. I no. mean, I've, I haven't been interviewed directly by Howard. I, I would love to someday. Um, but well, what would you rather do? Would you rather be interviewed directly by Howard or, uh, like J.D. would do, inter- you interview Howard the other way around? I mean, I would love to interview Howard. I would love to do therapy with Howard um, yeah. to see if I could get in touch with his vulnerability side. What do you um, think they are? I mean, you, you've been on the – have you been uh, – see, I've, I've been in studio a couple times as a guest up there at uh, the McGraw-Hill Building uh, XM Series. Have, I know you've been on his show, but have you been an in-studio guest? I have not been a studio. So you've never guest. met him. You've, you've never you've been on the show, but you've never met Howard. I've been on the show, but I've never met him. Okay, yeah, but but, but mean, you but you know him. You're a fan of his. You've been on the show. Well, what do you think? Because it's interesting. I'll ask you the same thing. Just from talking on his show without meeting him and knowing him as well as you do, he's a very open guy for thirty years. What do you think um, are some of his obvious vulnerabilities? I mean, I think that you know because of the effort that he's put into his career and the way that he, you know, seems to define himself by what he does, um, I think that he's going to have a lot of, um, you know, I don't want to say difficulty, but I think it's going to be a struggle the way that he processes confronting his own mortality. Um, and his parents' mortality. So I would love a chance to mm. talk to him about that. So you think he's afraid? See, the guys on my show, they welcome death. They're so miserable in their everyday existence, they can't <laughs> wait to die. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of us, you know, we kind of jump to that when things get really tough. Um, we have sort of like a fight-or-flight response to 
stress, um, or fi- fight, flight, um, or freeze response yeah. to stress is, yeah. is what... Yeah, you you uh you, yeah you do you you become automatically crippled. Elizabeth Mandel joining us right now live from New York City. So one of the things that um that you wanted to talk about today was for the guys out there. Obviously, predominantly my audience is male for a sports talk station and all that. So I have a lot of females that listen to, but it's predominantly male. And um, well, more more than ever, women are running from men. They are running away from from men and. You seem to have an idea why that would be the case. What what are men doing these days that has your gender running in the opposite direction? Men are doing such a good job that women don't know what to do with themselves. Women are like they they don't know what the challenge is anymore. So they're getting all this love from the men and they're used to playing the game. So they're they don't know what the game is anymore. So, you know, there's no game with a lot of these men because the men are sick of playing these games. So the women run away from the men who aren't playing the games anymore to find the men who are playing the games. So, so you're telling me it's not a matter of, um, of commitment. It's not that they're afraid of commitment, um, whether it's physically and or mentally, it's, it's that uh, they want a guy who's going to be uh, kind of wrapped up in the whole thing, who's kind of neurotic about the whole thing, and when, in fact, the man shows that that's not going to be the case, that he's, you know, I love you and everything's great and, and there is no drama. You're saying without the drama, the female doesn't seem to really enjoy the whole situation. Yeah, the females are looking for the drama. The females are looking but for why? the But why? 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 What is wrong? Why? You know, I don't disagree with you, but... What the heck is wrong with you people? Why? Leave it alone. Okay. Life is difficult enough. Jesus effing Christ. Okay, because women think to themselves, if if I'm not a difficult um, prize to to get, if I don't make myself hard to win, then I'm not worthy. So they they say to themselves, if if I'm too easy to win. If this guy's making it so easy for me and it's not complicated and the guy's not playing any games and it's, you know, he's giving his love so freely and he's offering a commitment to me, then am I really, you know, so worth the prize or am I settling? You know, I, I always wonder this. Uh, women, uh, the, 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 obviously, there's one part of women that love the guy, that bends over backwards to make her happy. Uh, you're like that, Lingo, right? Always complimenting Alicia and all that stuff, right? And, I yeah. Mean, uh, my, my guy, Eric, here, he does the best he can. I mean, he's, he doesn't have a lot of money. But you, you would say, Eric, that you're uh, very complimentary towards Alicia, that type of thing, yes? Yeah, yeah. Tell her how beautiful she is all the time. Right. Um, don't bang any chicks on the side. I don't do that. Not that she knows about you seem to be the type of guy that cares about her feelings, right? Yes. And, and she, she feels the same way about you, right? You, you seem to get the, the same in, uh, in turn, right? Yes, I do. Which I get from Danielle, too. But it seems like, Elizabeth, once again showing how crazy your gender is, is that uh, I know guys that treat their, their girlfriends and wives like crap. They don't care. They go play golf 80 hours a day. They're traveling five or six days a week. Now, look, as long as they're paying the bills and the kid's going to private school and you can get your nails done and play tennis, you seem to be happy. But I see a lot of examples where the husband pays little to no attention, doesn't even try, and you guys are okay. What's that all about? That the men don't pay attention to the women and the women seem happy about it? Yeah, you don't care. As long as you get the money and the bills are paid and you can uh, get your nails done and play tennis and have lunch with your yenta pain-in-the-ass girlfriends and do that stuff, you seem to be fine. Well, I mean, sometimes those women have affairs. What? Yeah, it happens. Women have men on the side that they have, you know sexual or emotional affairs with because they're not getting their needs what is that what is an emotional affair is that like a facebook type of thing a a twitter type of thing a what is an an emotional affair an emotional affair is when a woman is talking to a man outside of her relationship and sharing things with him that she wouldn't share with her like boyfriend what? Like pictures about of her, like, her like, relationship. Oh, okay. But you don't mean like, like, like sharing things like pictures of her vagina or something like that. that that's, that's... I mean, yes, that's included <gasps> in it. Eric, geez, you hear this? Eric, are you listening to this? 
I hear it. What, what do you think about that? I've I've seen emotional relationships on um the uh, Fifty Ways to Divorce Div- Guide or what's that TV show? You see that? Yeah, I've emotional um, emotional relationships. Yeah, like yeah, online or through like you know. Yeah, does that? And usually when somebody's having an emotional relationship, Liz Mandel, whether it's a guy and a girl, is that because they've given up on uh, on their significant other, or maybe they haven't given up, but they're just not getting just enough? Well, what are your thoughts there? They're not. They're not getting enough. No. I think that. Once it crosses into, like, a sexual affair, I think that's when people have really started to check out of their relationship. But emotional affairs can, um, can be a gateway to that. So when someone is having an emotional affair, yeah. they may not have checked out of their relationship, but they may be starting to. Have you had both? So- have you? Have you? Uh, one of the things I like about you, Liz, is uh, you've readily admitted on this program that while you um, you serve as a therapist up in New York City and you, you, you do all these radio shows and you seem to have a pretty good grasp on why people are so effed up is that you involve your own life, your own experiences, and you're not afraid to talk about those. So have you right. had both emotional and sexual uh, affairs? And are you having both, in fact, right now? <laughs> um, I've never had a sexual affair. Um, in my previous relationship, uh, there was a situation that did cross the line to, you know, what the what the guy would call like an emotional affair because I wasn't getting what I needed. What did, um, what did you of, need? But what was it physical? Was it uh, what exactly did you need that he couldn't give you? And and by the way, if in fact, no, look, I'm married 23 years, so I'm, we're, we're fine, we're great. But if in fact you're kind of in that slippery slope where this thing can go one way or the other, it could go either way, and yeah. one of the partners is unhappy, what do you recommend that unhappy partner does? Well, you have to communicate about it. You have to speak up. And what if say, you're scared? Look. What if you're scared? Maybe so she'll yell at you or something, or he'll, or he'll yell at you. It's not always yeah, that easy. Well, that's what that's what happened to me. I mean, I was I was scared to speak up. I mean, I was dating someone who you know had a very high powered job, and you know just couldn't make me a priority, um, you know, no. in his life to the extent that I needed. And it was tough, you know. People get themselves into situations where they get seduced by money and power, sure. um, and they don't realize that, you know, this person may not have the availability or the emotional resources to give mm. them what they need. And so I found myself in a situation where I wasn't getting what I needed emotionally from my partner at the time and so i started talking to um another guy um uh through text um (gasps) and i didn't tell my boyfriend at the time um and i needed that and he found out about it and he Mm -hmm. was very upset and well, you messed up. Elizabeth Mandela, a few more minutes yeah. here with, uh, with Liz, and then we'll, uh, we'll get to Adam Rubin talking about the Mets. I do want to ask you about uh, two more things we'll let you run, and uh, you're going to come on every, if not every week, every other week, because I believe you provide a service on this program that uh, no one else can offer. That's how good you are. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. My, my partner here, Eric Langell, who uh, if you go on my Facebook page and on my Twitter page, you can see him. He's a good-looking guy. He's my age. He'll be 48. He's in great shape. He's a heck of a guy. Sweetheart. Really nice guy. But he's got some emotional issues. And, what are you um, talking about? What's that? What are you talking about? One of the things he likes to do with his girlfriend, Liz, and uh, his fiance, soon to be his wife, although she's already carrying his name, which is odd, um, they role play. So, in other words, he'll come home one night dressed in a police officer outfit. He will beat her down to the point where she's unconscious with a nightstick and then, uh, and then have sex with her like she's some type of a barbaric prisoner. What do you think about that? Is that normal? Sure. I mean, as long as the ground rules are set, you know, and they have like a safe word. I mean, people, you know, can have fun with any sort of fantasy. I think that's wonderful that, you know, it works for them both. What about you? Again, let's let's, let's, uh, because you say you do these things. Do you do that with your boyfriend right now? Role play, things like that. Um, I mean, sometimes we do sort of, you know... Give me an example of a role play in the Mandel New York City apartment. What happens? Give me the characters. Give me the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, we we have yet to explore more of the role play. 
um, in our sex life. So that's something that's still unfolding. You know, we, we want to keep our sex life very fresh. Mm-hmm. And so we don't like to exhaust mm-hmm. all of, you know, the different options that there are um, for, for keeping sex interesting. So mm-hmm. we're taking it slow. Taking it slow. Well, what do you think about people uh, uh, that involve other parties? Now, look, I think it's sick, to be honest with you. I think uh, I got friends and people like like a lot. That swing, you know, they go, which I, I find nothing more repulsive, nothing more disgusting than uh, making your wife and or your girlfriend have sex with somebody else in front of you. I mean, you got to be a real sick bastard, to be honest. But uh, people do do that. So, for example, have you and your boyfriend ever talked about maybe uh, having Elephant Boy come over on a Tuesday? <laughs> um, no, we, we haven't. I mean, it, it, I think it, it came up once and it was just as a joke. Um, but we've never talked about anything like that. You know, it, couples have different rules in their relationship, but it can be very dangerous to let other people in. Um, literally. To, yeah, literally, <laughs> and to see um, your partner, yeah. you know, engage in sexual activity with someone <clears throat> else and to have that imagery in your mind um, and to, you know, witness that intimacy. Um, It's hard to separate in the moment, you know, the intimacy from the sexual act, and you don't know how you're going to feel in the moment. So no matter how much you prepare for it and just say, I'm going to detach from my emotions, like in the moment, you know, you could say, well, let me just kind of numb my, my feelings about it and get drunk, and, you know, so that way it'll just be easier for everyone. Well, still, people can get hurt. Sure. So you really want to think about it, um, and, you know, it, it may, it, you, you want to think that it, it could end the relationship, so you don't want to overlook that possibility if, if you're really strongly considered. All right, on the way out here, then, I could not agree with you more. I think it's sick. On the way out here, uh, you did talk about anal. I got a buddy of mine who says uh, he's married a long time. I'll, I'll leave his name out, Chris. And uh, he says that he would not want to do that uh, because that's the mother of my children, as if uh, doing that type of, that specific act demeans or devalues his wife. Um I don't know if that's the case or not, but you say that you've got a sure fire way. You've got a sure fire way for the men out there to make sure it happens. So, uh, in, in, please, in, in less graphic detail, tell us how that's the case. All right. Well, you got to, I mean, it's a process, so it's not like it comes down to a conversation, but it's all about grooming the woman. <laughs> okay? So, it's going to take massages, um, it's going to take loving conversations, mm. it's going to take attention, nurturance. you got to build up to it. you got to put in your time, um, mm. and you also got to have jewelry involved, and I'm not talking about anal beads. Sure, right, of course not. Um, you, you know, <laughs> right. you, uh, you got to... Yeah. Um, make sure that you work on your massage technique, sure. um, especially when you attempt it. Yes. Because the body needs to be very relaxed, mm-hmm. and people, you know, can be very afraid of doing it. Sure. Um, the, sure. the body tenses up, and, uh, you know, literally, the, like, the body doesn't want to let anyone in. Sure. Um, sure. So, you know, you need to use your voice. Use your body language to relax the body. Um, is this something that um, is this? Are you a fan of this? You do this uh, often, uh, every now and then. Is it? What about every you? now and then? Sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. Good. Yeah. 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 You know. What about we, you, Langell? What uh, is that? Something that you guys? I know she's Greek, Alicia. Is that something you guys practice at uh, in Pembroke Pines? I just usually use my thumb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Well, I got to say, you, um, we're getting tweets right now from the Elephant Boy, ironically. We did mention Fred the Elephant Boy from the Howard Stern Show. You, uh, you've nailed it again. Uh, I hate to say this because I don't want to minimize or demean what you did your first time, but if it's even possible, you are better today. So, Aww. God, were you great today. So keep coming. We'll do this again next week, and 
Thank you so much. That was a, a very uh, productive, a very instructional, and a terrific 20 minutes. Elizabeth, you're great. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. All right. That was great stuff. And uh, John Larkin, our good buddy, uh, body from uh, Buddy. I say, I say body. When I think of John Larkin, I think about uh, Busy Body. Of course, uh, the gym I go to each and every day with the beautiful Katie Bartlett. John Larkin checks in, and um, he said Mike Stanton should try to... Should try that to loosen up just a bit. <laughs> Maybe Matt Latos last night could have used Elizabeth Mandel's advice not to give up seven runs in the first inning to the Braves, right? Very, very informative. So you won't hear last time she was on because your no, dad I, wasn't I feeling was well. Ross Levy was filling in that day. This was about two weeks ago. So this is the first time you've heard Liz, who, again, yes. has been on the Howard Stern Show many times. She, went, she was, in fact, on CBS Sports Talk Radio Valentine's Day. But, of course, that was a very vanilla conversation. They can't say the types of things that we say here. So that's your first experience, your first time you've heard her. What would you think? I liked her. She was very informative. I like the. I uh, mean, how the hell is Adam Rubin talking Mets or Joe Frisaro talking Marlins or even Norm Coleman, my cousin, talking politics in 35 minutes going to measure up to that? I, I have no idea. Well, I mean, you can talk to Adam about the same things. Really? You might have some advice. Anal with Adam Rubin? Well, you want to shake it up a little, right? <laughs> no. More Sid Rosenberg Five. on 640 Sports. Now more sends in front. Shepard scores. James Shepard out of the flexion. The Ranger fourth line comes up with a big goal. It's now 3-1 to one with 9-19 remaining. Hayes jumps on a loose puck. Drops it off for Haglund. He scores. Into an empty net. Carl Haglund with a minute 48 remaining. Rangers lead 4-2. Final seconds ticking off. Ranger fans are standing here and exploding with cheers. Two seconds to go. The New York Rangers are the number one team in the NHL. They have won the President's Trophy. 111 points this season. The second highest total in franchise history. The Rangers defeat the Devils 4-2 and a tremendous road effort there. League-leading 27th road win. Boy, you look at the way they've reacted to this. You don't think this means something to these players to get the President's Trophy? Even before the final buzzer, Sam, I look on the bench and I see Lundquist and McDonough giving each other a hug. This was really important to this team. They came out after playing a hard, tough game last night. A rested Devils team. They had a dominating first period. And then in this third period, the Devils cranked it up a couple of notches, and so did the Rangers. I think everyone knows uh, that winning games in playoffs is uh, 10 times harder than in winning in regular season. And uh, it, uh, you know, we're, I think we're excited to, to get it started. And uh, yeah, it's just going gonna, gonna to be a lot of fun. It is season two. And, and use what we've learned this season to, to make us a, a good hockey team and use it as best we can going into playoffs. Mark, was tonight in some ways though almost a little dress rehearsal for that given what they were doing for so much of the game behind the play after the play? Yeah, it was a, it's a chippy, gritty game. They, um, they weren't playing like a team that was out of the playoffs, that's for sure. They wanted to win and um, they were they're playing physical and playing hard. And, Great building to, to win, and that's for sure. We had, we had a lot of fans here tonight, and it was pretty evident. We, we heard them and felt them, and uh, it was a, a great win for us. I'll be kind if you'll be faithful, you be sweet, and I'll be grateful. Cover me with kisses, dear, lighten up the atmosphere. Keep me warm inside our bed, I got dreams of you all through my head. Fortune tell us that I'd be free And that's the day you came to me
Liz Mandel of some good stuff. Well, the Rangers, and the Rangers have won the Stanley Cup. Kenny Albert and Sam Rosen on the call, and oh, we know how much I love the Florida Panthers, and Vinny Viola, Doug Sipu, Steve Goldstein, Randy Moeller, all the guys, but we're not making the playoffs this year. Won a lot of games, had a great season, the biggest turnaround in the NHL this year, the Panthers. That's right. That is a statistical fact, and with two more games to go, both home games, Thursday against the Bruins and Saturday against the aforementioned New Jersey Devils, it was a better year for the Panthers, but... It came up short. Now I can turn my attention to the team I really rooted for my whole life, and that is the New York Hockey Rangers with the win last night, 111 points. They have wrapped up the President's Cup, which goes to the team in hockey that has the most points during the regular season. Montreal, five back of the Rangers. Michael Kotze's club. Tampa Bay, seven back of the Rangers. And an unbelievable year. You know, at one point, the Islanders had a big lead on the Rangers, and then the Rangers uh, lost their starting goaltender, Henrik Lundqvist. In fact, I was in New Jersey that night with the Panthers when he took one right on the chin, just like Liz Mandel. But Cam Talbot stepped in, did a great job, and all these guys stepped up. They beat the, the Devils last night 4-2. to two. Kevin Hayes, whose brother Jimmy had a very good year for the Panthers, scored his 16th goal. Ryan McDonough, number 8. James Shepard, number 7. Haglin, his 17th, the empty netter. And the Rangers... Go into the uh, Stanley Cup here, looking uh, looking like world beaters after playing in the Stanley Cup Finals last year and coming up short to the Los Angeles Kings. Now, who they play in the first round is another story. Big game tonight for Ranger fans, Boston in Washington. If the season ended today, the Rangers would play the Bruins in the first round. It's a pretty good matchup, New York-Boston. Uh, but right there are the uh, Detroit Red Wings and the Pittsburgh Penguins. Any one of those three teams can take on the Rangers in the first round. You are, look at you are gunned up, aren't you? I'm ready. I love uh, Stanley Cup playoffs are, are great. God, we were there last year. I talked about this earlier today. That Wednesday night, four days before Coto Martinez at Madison Square Garden and four days before California Chrome was running for the Triple Crown at Belmont, Z-Mac and I arrived in New York City, Game 1, Rangers-Kings, Stanley Cup Finals, and 7th Avenue and 8th Avenue and 9th Avenue from about 24th to about 42nd Street just littered with Ranger jerseys, guys and girls, and it was just it was outrageous, man. And we went to um, the place next to the Flying Puck, some real old-fashioned Irish bar right across the street from Madison Square Garden because the Rangers played uh, the first two games in Los Angeles, and it was wild, man. I mean, z an Islander fan, and he couldn't help but get caught up in it. So it's going to happen again, it looks like. Yeah, it looks that way. Except this year, now that we're owned by um, Palm Beach Broadcasting, big-time company, big-time company, and my man um, Dean Goodman, it's my guy. I couldn't pick Dean Goodman out of a lineup, by the way. Never met him, never Hi. spoke to him. Couldn't pick him out of a lineup, but he's my guy. And uh, Liz Hama, she calls herself Beth, actually. Elizabeth Hama. And uh, Leo, Leo. Um, we don't know his last name. DeRocher. Yet. Go with that for right now. Yep, and uh, the whole crew there. Now that, uh, now that they're running things here and they've got money, well, Dean's got a lot of money, and we're going to take a lot of it. So they can like send us places and do stuff and make it almost like a real radio show. Yeah, they they had. I'm sick and tired. Money of was never brought up once, or it was never they, an they issue. They have plenty of it. I'm sick and tired of doing all the work myself. That's all I've done my whole career. Even at WFAN, when I was there during the heyday, they had Imus, they had Mike and the Mad Dog. I broke my ass to maintain the same amount of publicity and and um, recognizability. That was all me. I was one of the first guys at FAN ever to have a damn his own website. Thanks to Kevin Canessa. Since I've been here in Miami, between um, Lincoln Financial at 790, they don't do dick. WQAM, they don't do much either. And certainly this place, which I'll always be endeared to and in debt to. And both of those guys, the Hilliards and even Lapa, all those guys, Rick Hines, well, they've, uh, they've really given me a shot here. I'll always love them, but, I mean, it has been, it's, it's, it's difficult to keep my, I, I mean, I, how in the hell I'm, I'm able to maintain the audience in New York City that I do. And I was on a, as a guest again last night, this time not on WFN, on WOR, 710 AM, where the new home of the Mets the last two years. They've also got Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity. In the morning, they've got uh, Todd Schnitt and Len Berman. And I was a guest of Sal Licata last night. How I've been able to maintain all of that, uh, doing shows on the fan and, 
and the stuff up in New York and, and the big audience here is really because of me. That's, I got no help. None. Nobody's ever put up a billboard. I mean, we, you and I have, I've, I've talked about this a million times. There is nobody else in this town, not Dan Lebitard, not Joe Rose, not any of these guys, that uh, if you're traveling from out of town, you're going to know who that is. Now, Dan, yes, now, Lebitard, because of his um, TV show with his father, which is actually pretty good. But none of these other guys have any national recognition. Uh, and, and me, and you, you've experienced this, to this day I still have people go, oh, man, Sid from the fan, Sid from Imus. When did you get here? Well, I've been here for a decade, but nobody knows. <laughs> And if not for me breaking my own ass and spending my own money, which I don't have any of, I'd have nothing. So it's nice now to get these uh, Palm Beach people to actually help out here. And, uh, you know, you, you would agree that they seem very excited about having us, specifically us, this show. And um, they talk about having the resources to do some things. And, well, let's just do it then. Let's go. Anyway, 888-640-9385. As always, that's the number, 888-640-9385. We're going to talk New York Met baseball, which I'm very excited about, with Adam Rubin of ESPN. One quick call. Here's uh, Steve. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Sydney. I'll make it real quick, but I got to tell you, everything you're touching on as far as how you put the station on the map is absolutely correct, and I'm not blowing air up. Uh, listen, skirt, listen I I, I'll tell you, you so I'll give you some inside baseball. I had lunch with Joe Bell, who runs WQIM, now CBS, uh, two of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he said, just like you, right to my face, he said, you, amazingly, he said, you made 640 a legitimate player here. And this is a guy that's in the business who, uh, for a long time, he said the same exact thing. Correct. So with new ownership, this is just a business thought that I would share with you. You should go in there. You should have a piece of the company. I don't care if it's 1%, but you should have a little equity stake because what you did to the station, you took it from just empty airwaves to an asset, an actual asset. And with new ownership, forget about just income and this and this. You should have a percent. You should have some equity. God, I love you. I wish you owned the station. Well, he's right about that, but have your agent. Have your agent uh, take that up. My agent. That's Owner, another story. Ownership. I don't be need like, an agent. Be I like karma. I, I don't need an agent, okay? I don't need somebody to take 10% of my money to do what I've done my whole career anyway. I love Mark Lebsell. So he's a friend and he's been my agent for a very, very long time. And But uh, truth is, is that I get most of my jobs on my own. You know, when, um, when the Arena Football League wanted me to be the voice of the New York Dragons, they called me, not my agent. When Best Damn Sports Show wanted me to do a fantasy baseball segment, once a week with Chris Rose and Tom Arnold, guess who they called? Me, not my agent. When W Up Man wanted me back, they called me. When Joe Bell wanted me back, he called me. When 640 wanted me after WQIM, they called me. The point is, is uh, when CSTV wanted me to host all of their television programming, all of it, which is now CBS Cable Channel, they called me. So what do I need an agent for? Uh, Hopefully this guy, Dean Goodman, is not just another shyster. Just another one of these um, guys in the business, loaded with these guys. And hopefully he's uh, he's the real deal. I hear very good things about him. He can't be an idiot. He had no stations a couple of years ago. He made four stations into 110 overnight. So this guy's got to be very, very uh, smart and business savvy. And he knows what he's getting with me and us. So I don't need an agent. I mean, Dean should be, seriously, Dean should just call me. Forget about Liz Hama or uh, Joe or Leo. Dean should call me and say, hey, Sid, we're going out for dinner, we're going out for lunch. What can I do to make you happy? That's what he should do. Will he do that? No. It doesn't work that way. So I got to go down there and explain to him what me and this show means to his, uh, his property. I understand WRMF gets great ratings, and they do the little cute little Elvis Duran Z morning Palm Beach Zoo show, and... They got the country music station up there, and they got some hip hop station. But that, that's FM. That's that's music. It's FM. It's not the same. He's got one of the most recognized. Like me, hate me. It doesn't matter. He's got one of the most recognizable talkies in the country. He's got an opportunity to make something really good here, but he needs to step up, or I'll leave. It's really that simple. Well, you can't do that. I can't. We just got there. Oh. I mean, doesn't matter to me. I haven't even settled. Our in yet. time is now. That's it. I'm tired of everybody else making money off of me, making money off of us, telling us how great we are, 
Oh, you're great. You're the best. You're the best. And I can't rub two nickels together. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. There are guys in this business making upwards of a half a million, a million dollars a year who don't hold my left nut. And I'm tired of it. So if Dean Goodman and Palm Beach Broadcasting is serious about this stuff, then um, it's time to, to, to A, pay up and B, be up. Let's talk. Let's be serious about this. Stop the nonsense. I don't want to hear how great I am anymore. You know what? Tell me I suck. Just pay me. The pats on the back aren't doing no, it anymore. Yeah. Blow me with that, okay? It's enough. <laughs> just blow no. me. Say, hey, Sid, truth is you're not all that good, but you make a lot of money. So here's some money and here's some. We're going to put up a billboard. We're going to do a TV commercial. We're going to do something. Don't tell me how good I am anymore. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Tell me how good I am, and then you got some 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 uh, some guy who shouldn't who shouldn't be doing updates on a Sunday at three o'clock in the morning, demanding a, a day part. I don't want to hear it. So, excuse me for not being as enthusiastic as the rest of you are, because I've, I've played this game a thousand times. So meetings are great and nice to meet everybody and all that stuff. But let's go. Let's play ball. I'm sorry. You think I'm, I'm not even kidding here? No, no, no. I'm I'm right with you. I'm, yeah. I'm ready, now, Liz Mandel ready got me all action. fired up. So. Who did? Liz Mandel. In what way? How I don't know. Fired up? What was uh, the conversation? Was tintillating. Well, and now we're going to talk Mets with Adam Rubin, and the oh. Mets are the best team in baseball. They are. They're better than your Marlins. Well, for the moment. Is Matt Lato still in the game? Did he get out of the first inning yet? No, they're still <laughs> yeah, hitting tape measure <laughs> shots off him. <laughs> it's still the top of the first in Miami? It's, it's still batting practice right, down in Marlins Park. It's <laughs> the yeah. Mets and Nationals. Game two of that series coming up later on tonight. Reigning rookie of the year, Jacob DeGrom on the mound for the Mets. Zimmerman on the mound for the Nats. And they wrap it up tomorrow with a matinee game in Washington, D.C. It'll be Strasburg and Matt Harvey. Adam Rubin covers the Mets on a daily basis for ESPNNewYork.com. And he joins us right after this. Okay, guys. Welcome to paradise. Welcome back to the Sid Rosenberg Show on 640 Sports. The New York Mets get what they deem favorable news on their closer, Henry Mejia. Alongside Eduardo Perez, I am Jim Basquale. They get the diagnosis that it's uh, stiffness and pain in his right elbow inflammation in the back of the pitching elbow. He gets a cortisone shot. He's going to be on the DL. So it's not a tear. He's not diagnosed out for the season. But could this be a problem down the road as we look in the, in the near future with the Mets? Well, right now, definitely a problem because anytime you have pain, yeah. the source is somewhere near. And that's the part you have to worry about. Fortunately for them, he was open enough with them. He let them True. know that there is some pain. They, they addressed it before it even got worse. A lot of young pitchers nowadays, they have some pain. Yeah. They take a couple Advils and they say, okay, mm-hmm. I'm ready to go. But at least he was able to let his organization know they got some, they got the, uh, cortisone injection yeah. there, and maybe, maybe we'll find out in 10 days if he's sure. able or enough to pitch without any pain. Yeah, you just told me about the, the, a cortisone helps the healing process, so you give him those two weeks, so to speak, and, and then you hope everything's right after that. But you can make the argument that uh, Jerry's Familia is a better option for them as closer. He had a stronger season a year ago, but overall, he was your eighth inning guy. Mejia was your ninth inning guy. When you disrupt the pecking order in the bullpen, how does it perhaps impact the bullpen as a whole. Oh, big time. And that's the concern that I'm not only the manager, but also the pitching coach and the organization have. Do you move Familia now to the closer role? Then what do you do in the eighth inning? What do you do in the seventh inning? Sure. You need that lights out, swing and miss guy instead of having a pitch to contact. That's what Familia brings you. He brings you that swing and miss option. And that's why I still like him in that eighth inning role. Another New York Met pitcher seemingly on the shelf that always uh, scares Met fans. Mets do come off a very impressive 3-1 to one road win against the Nats on opening day. They are back at it later on tonight. From the nation's capital, the reigning rookie of the year, Jacob DeGrom, on the mount for the Mets today. Matt Harvey will tow the rubber a matinee affair in D.C. tomorrow. Adam Rubin, just on ESPN, does a great job covering the Mets on a daily basis for ESPNNewYork.com. And 
Here he is. Adam, good morning. How are you, pal? Excellent, sir. Thank you. Uh, nice to have you. I uh, Listen, I'm not a knee-jerk guy. I was actually on WOR last night in, in New York. They've got the Mets up there, you know. And uh, they brought me on to talk about the Mets. I'm not a knee-jerk guy. Certainly one game doesn't mean a heck of a lot. But I, I say this with uh, supreme confidence, that one game in, it's pretty clear that the Mets are going to win the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they almost got no hit and won the game. So That's right. I suppose that bodes well for karma. They only went 4-15 against the Nationals like a year ago. So any way you can eke out a victory is, is great. I mean, the Nationals are Right, the, the Nationals, Nationals are, great Nationals are too. Yeah. Great the, the, the Nationals are missing uh, a ton of pieces right now. Jason Worth is out. Denard Span is out. Anthony Rendon is out. But I'm mean, sure Scherzer was absolutely dominant on opening day. He took that no-hitter two outs into the, the sixth inning. The error at shortstop, the first of two errors at shortstop by Ian Desmond led to the uh, no-hitter getting broken up and a couple runs scoring. But but uh, it's, it's going to be a long season. The Nationals are plenty good. No, they're great. They should win that division going away. I, I will ask you, though, about this on a serious note. You know, Met fans are always complaining to me, Adam, about injuries, specifically to pitchers, right? Harvey two years ago, Wheeler last year. Uh, now, uh, now, you know, he is banged up. But almost every single year, the Mets are losing pitchers. Now, for a while, they're position players, too, guys like Jose Reyes. I know that up in New York you get the same thing. A lot of Met fans complain. What is going on with Met players, specifically pitchers, that they're always getting hurt? Now, I think it's unfair because there were like 30 guys who required Tommy John last year. It was not exclusive to the Mets. But for the paranoid Met fan, what do you say about that? Yeah, I mean, just like you said, I don't think there's a higher percentage of injuries with the Mets than other teams. Uh, it's just it, there's been a rash of, of elbow injuries with the Mets over the last couple of years. Heck, I mean, this year alone in spring training, both Zach Wheeler and Josh Edgen go down in spring training and need Tommy John surgeries. And then Mejia on opening day, it looked like he might need Tommy John surgery too. It turned out to be less serious, at least right now, than, than that. Uh, they said there's no structural damage, just inflammation. They gave him a cortisone shot and put him on the DL. But, I mean, during the winter, they were saying there was no structural damage with Zach Wheeler's two MRIs at that point. So uh, we'll, we'll see where this goes when he comes back off the DL, if, if there's still pain or not. But uh, for now, Jerry's Familia is going to be the closer. And like you said in the clip leading in, uh, everything else, everyone else is going to kind of slide, up, slide back in the pecking order and then but you don't think, I mean, you know, listen, I, I, I can say this. I'm in Miami. They've got some wonderful hospitals down here. Jackson Memorial is a great hospital. I know you've got Sloan Kettering in New York. We've got Sylvester down here. But everybody knows that in terms of hospitals and doctors and surgeons, Presbyterian, the best hospitals are in New York City. So the idea that the Mets would have a, a lousy staff when it comes to that and not do a good job with their players almost seems kind of silly. You would agree that it's more circumstance and, um, and coincidence that Met guys are going down rather than the Met medical staff or something they're doing wrong. Well, certainly David Alcheck, the Mets team doctor, uh, I mean, I've read in recent weeks how other people with elbow injuries went to him for second opinion, just like the Mets players go to James Andrews for second opinion. So, I mean, I don't think there's anything there. Now, if you ask me about 10 years ago or eight years ago when, say, like Omar and Tony Bernersard was the, uh, the deputy to the, the GM, they aggressively pushed injured pitchers. I still remember... Billy Wagner was having elbow pain, and they said, tough it out, tough it out. Yeah, yeah. And and he ended up needing Tommy John surgery because he was toughing out with an injury. Or J.J. puts at the time, they shot him with cortisone instead of shutting him down, and he kept pitching through the, the pain, and well, the, the cortisone was masking the pain, and he, he did worse damage to his elbow. So, I mean, it, if you're asking me eight years ago, did the Mets aggressively push injured people and cause further injury, I could say probably yes, but but now not not. Not in the least. They're very conservative with innings, in fact. Gotcha. Adam Rubin, uh, great job covering the Mets daily basis, ESPNNewYork.com, Mets and Nets. Later on tonight, uh, familiar now, like you said, will be the closer. Buddy Carlisle got the same opening day, and he was uh, one of the very last Mets, nearly uh, 60 years old, to make the team, yes? <laughs> yeah, he only made the team because they carried eight relievers and four bench players to start the year. And, and obviously, Terry wouldn't have done that pecking order at the end of the game if he knew that. Uh, Mejia wasn't going to be available. They they would have just Carlisle would have pitched like the sixth or seventh, and after Cologne came out and, and Familia would have handled the ninth. But but they didn't know until Mejia started warming up that the elbow issue was was there. So it's a short. 
Familia actually may be the best candidate among the people on the staff to close. So it, from that res- perspective, it, it's not the, the worst thing in the world. But now Carlos Torres, who's had a lot of tread on the tires the last couple of years, Terry Collins has used him a lot, and he looked a little shaky in spring training, even though he was good on opening day. He's going to handle the eighth inning. And uh, Rafael Montero may handle the seventh inning, and he's a guy who's a, been a st- very, very talented, in fact, he arguably should have replaced Dylan G in the rotation, but he's a starting pitcher in the minor leagues, so they wanted to ease him into relief work, and now they may throw him into a, a late inning. Now, it's really just a short-term problem. Because even if Mejia doesn't come back, they do have two late-inning relievers who are poised to come back within a few weeks, Vic Black and Bobby Parnell. So so they'll get two guys with – well, Parnell has been the closer in the past. Vic Black has handled eighth innings and maybe an occasional save, too. So they're getting two more guys back within a couple weeks. So the familiar thing – uh, it, it's probably just a short-term thing unless he absolutely runs with it. I uh, saw so, so many stories about how not to get too carried away with the Met opening day win, Adam. You know, they, uh, I think they lost their first seven opening days all on the road, dating all the way back to 1962 when Frank Thomas had a home run and Roger Craig was the losing pitcher and they lost to St. Louis. Even in 1969, I think that was the first opening day at Shea, and they lost that day like 11-10 to Montreal, still won the, the, uh, the World Series. But I thought back to some of the great opening day moments in Met history. Uh, You know, Ray Ordonez in 96, the Royce Clayton play. But no matter how hard I tried not to go there, the one that came back to me every time was 1985. Gary Carter's first game as a New York Met, hitting the home run in extras off of Neil Allen to win the game. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the late great kid Gary Carter would have celebrated a birthday today, yes? Yeah, this would have been his birthday. He passed away during spring training a a couple years ago. You know, we were actually uh, just on the side. Uh, we went to Montreal on the eve of the season last year. I know they did the same thing this year with the, uh, the Blue Jays and the Reds. Last year it was the Blue Jays and the Mets, and they had Gary Carter's uh, widow Sandy and 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 one of her one of his daughters uh, pregame in a ceremony. It was it was one of the most unbelievable things I've I've ever seen at a, at a baseball stadium. There were forty five fifty thousand people at. Olympic Stadium last year, just saluting them. It was just an unreal scene. Mm. Timo Perez is 40 today. God, it seems like the World Series against the Yankees was 30 years ago. Yeah, we're, uh, we're all getting old. Oh, my God, are we getting old. So, so tell me this. Mets and Nats today, Jacob DeGrom won the Rookie of the Year last year. He came out of nowhere, right? Last year at this time, Adam, we're talking about great young Met pitching, Syndergaard and Montero. In comes DeGrom out of nowhere, wins Rookie of the Year. So with that said... How important is this start today, and really in whole, the stop more season for Jacob Degrom? Well, this is this was not a fluke last year with Jacob Degrom. He's the real deal, and he backed it up in, in spring training. I had a scout tell me during spring training that what Greg Maddox used to do with his changeup, just moving it around the strike zone, Jacob Degrom does the same thing with his with his fastball. He, he is just absolutely pinpoint. Uh, uh, he keeps the ball down, so he gets ground balls. I mean, he, he is the uh, the real deal. Uh, it, he didn't get the hype at that Noah Syndergaard, who never hasn't even made his debut yet, got that Matt Harvey got that Zach Wheeler got. But but Jacob Degrom uh, deserved being Rookie of the Year last year, and he, he deserves to be in that in that group. He's maybe he's not a number one, but he's certainly a number two type pitcher in the rotation. You know, as good as his spring training was, nobody was as dominant for the Mets, really in all of Major League Baseball this spring, is Matt Harvey. And uh, after tonight's game, the Mets play an afternoon, a matinee affair in D.C. tomorrow, wrap up the three-game series against the Nats. And Matt Harvey will take the mound for the first time in 593 days, reading tweets out of New York City, Adam, for the guys on OR, W, Up May, and all the Mets fans, and ESPN as well. Uh, seems like Matt Harvey Day tomorrow is a huge deal. Yeah, and, and we talked about DeGrom being the real deal and not being a fluke last year. Matt Harvey in spring training looked like the 2013 Matt Harvey, which is remarkable because even if he never had Tommy John surgery to duplicate what he did in 2013, uh, would be a lot to, to ask for. He was a starter in the All-Star game at City Field. was absolutely dominant until he needed the uh, Tommy John surgery. He Literally, his first game of spring training – he was touching 99 miles an hour coming back from Tommy John surgery wow. after not having pitched uh, in a competitive game for 18 months. He was sitting at 96, 97, 98 that game. He dialed it back a little bit the other games. He was more 93 to 95, but he said that velocity is still there. He was absolutely, as a dominant, uh, he had a 1.19 ERA, I want to say, in, in spring training. He had pitched 22 and two-thirds innings. He only walked one batter, and 
he's very conscious of the fact that guys coming back coming back from Tommy John surgery sometimes are not as effective with their control the first year back. But he was unbelievable with the control. As I said, only one walk in 22 and two-thirds yeah. innings in spring training. Uh, so on the way out, the uh, a kind of an interesting opening day lineup for Terry Collins Adam, uh, in D.C., having David Wright hit second. You know, Joey Votto, a lot of power there in Cincinnati. He hit second, too, for the Reds' opening day against the Pirates. But David Wright hitting second in that Met lineup. And I know raised a lot of eyebrows up there in New York. What were your thoughts, and what do you expect from the Met lineup tonight? Well, I think it's going to be similar, if not identical. Uh, Terry did David batting second in spring training, so it wasn't an absolute surprise. But they, they had had two considerations in spring training. One was either uh, Juan Lagares leading off. The other was Curtis Granderson leading off. Uh, they decided to go with the Granderson leading off, even though Lagares had an excellent spring. And their logic is, and, and this is coming from above, Terry, but the logic being that if David Wright is a number three hitter, statistically he comes up with no uh, two outs and nobody on base more frequently than if he batted number two. So they wanted to, to have him number two to get more RBI opportunities, I suppose, even though intuitively you would think number three has more RBI opportunities than number two. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. And that's especially true if the pitcher bats eighth as opposed to ninth. Right. Now, Cologne is not very strong batting, so they bat him ninth, but wouldn't be shocked to see DeGrom batting eighth today. Yeah, I wouldn't either. Uh, so again, you're going to have a Granderson leading off, David Wright hitting second, Lucas Duda hitting third, and the newly acquired Michael Kadire hitting cleanup. It was also nice to see Travis Darno with that RBI triple after a lousy spring training. Uh, an exciting time right now for New York Met fans like us, Adam. And as always, you did a tremendous job. And it's only uh, game two of a long season together, which I look forward to. So thank you so much, pal. Great job. Oh, my pleasure. It's going to be a fun series because you got uh, Zimmerman against uh... Grom tonight and tomorrow is Harvey versus uh, Strasburg. So it's an unbelievable series. Matchup. Unbelievable. Oh, excellent job, Adam. Thank you so much. Again, to Grom and Zimmerman today, Harvey and Strasburg tomorrow. And uh, who do the Mets have this weekend? I know I brought this up yesterday. I forgot. I you know the Yankees have um, the Red Sox, the Marlins, who look like duty. They've got Tampa Bay. Who do the Mets have? Atlanta. Oh. They're going to Atlanta. Same team that's kicking the crap out of your team right now. Yeah, that's the team. Except they won't beat us like they're beating the Marlins. Well, you never know. No, no, no. They won't do it. They won't do it. You can't say that. They won't do it. You know who loves the Mets? Who loves the Mets? Rand Paul. Rand Paul? Yeah, loves him. All right, good for him. Yeah, I, I just made that up. I don't know, but he's in Kentucky. Talking about Rand Paul, my, uh, my cousin. I don't know why my cousin doesn't run for president. I swear to God. He was a great mayor in St. Paul. He was a great senator from Minnesota. He's best friends with the Bush family. The Republicans respect the hell out of the kid. He's a genius, and I mean that sincerely. He's a great kid. He understands foreign policy. Why Norm Coleman doesn't run for president, I don't know. It's not like these other folks are so damn good and experienced that Norm couldn't win. Why doesn't he run? I don't know. But we'll find out next.